Good morning, my name is Dr. Laura Ann Petito. I'm very happy to be here today. As Provost Erding mentioned, Gallaudet is the epicenter of a revolution, and she is certainly right. The world definitely has experienced revolutions in recognizing that ASL is a natural language. The world at large has also recognized that deaf people have a culture. Yet we still have a remaining issue. A third revolution has not yet happened, which is the one around biology. Many people still believe that speech is special, that we are biologically designed to speak, that sign is inferior to speech. People think that sign is not equivalent biologically to speech, and so if a child learns to sign, this will impair their chances of learning English and that in fact this will even hurt the human brain and destroy their chances of ever learning spoken language. These are commonly held misunderstandings. What I would like to share today is what our research has to show the world. One, that our biological brain assumptions are wrong, and the powerful translational impact that this has is that we can understand better how to teach deaf children, how to teach deaf children language. We also know that there are advantages in brain processing in young deaf children. And sadly, poor hearing, non-signing children lose that ability. They did have it when they were born, but they end up losing that ability. So the powerful translational implication here is that we could teach hearing children, all children, better ways of learning. And together, the significance of this, discoveries about our brain can revolutionize our thinking about hu the human being. This can lead to better laws and better policies that work in concert with human biology. Next. Many, research, many years of research have shown that sign, children who acquire sign language hit the same developmental milestones as children who are acquiring a spoken language. People will ask, though, about the brain tissue itself. For many years, we thought that a certain part of the brain that we thought was specifically for auditory processing, so much so that we called it auditory tissue, what happens when signs are processed in that area? People thought that it wouldn't be. But people process sign language and spoken language in the exact same tissue. Tissue that for 100 years, people thought was dedicated to auditory processing. We're finding that that is not the case. Science was wrong. This tissue is not dedicated for sound. Instead, it is dedicated to understanding the patterns of human language. Patterns that exist on the hands, patterns that exist on the tongue. The brain does not discriminate modality. Research has also proven that young deaf children exposed to sign language have visual processing and perceptual advantages that enable them to learn vocabulary and learn signs, learn a richer foundation of language, and to become eventual better readers, to become better at self-regulating their own attention. We also find that young hearing children are born with that capability, but because they don't have the experience of needing to use it, they lose this ability. This gives, means that we have the potential of impacting the lives of young hearing children based on what we really know about the brain from what we learn about young deaf children. We could also make policies for young deaf children to make sure that visual language is available to all deaf children early.
We also have many bilingual advantages that unfortunately still have a number of myths that surround them. Here are a number of them on the slide. One is that people think that children who get cochlear implants don't need sign language exposure, that instead they only need intensive speech training. This is wrong. People think that early sign exposure will impair or hurt someone's ability to learn English. This is also wrong. People think that parents must know sign language well before using the language with their children. This is not the case either. People also think that people, that children should that children should learn language in sequence, that they need to learn one language first and then another. Again, this is not what we see from our research. What we see is that bilingual infants are already bi better than their monolingual counterparts by 12 months of age from looking at their brain activation patterns. Take a look on the right side of the screen. You see here areas of activation in the brain where older bilinguals have more activation in this same region as opposed to older monolinguals on the left side of the screen. This means they have greater capability for language processing, and it is amazing that by only 12 months of age, you already see this advantage of bilingual exposure. If a young child is exposed to sign language and their brain is able to parse out the components of that language, including the phonological basis of that language, then they're able to map that phonology onto orthography, onto the written word, just like hearing children are doing when they're mapping on the phonology of their spoken languages onto the page. Researchers have found that if a child has none of that training, if a young child does not have phonological training, if they only have ASL exposure, they end up being better readers and writers. This provides evidence for the fact that ASL does not harm one's ability to develop literacy or to develop skills in English. This could end up leading to new teaching aids that would help hearing children who are struggling to develop literacy. So in sum, this offers new perspective on food for thought. We would never fail to give our children food because we know this would be harmful to their bodies. We should also not fail to give our children language because that is food for their brains. I believe that this can give way to a third revolution, that language is separate from sound, language is not speech, and that this can lead to new understandings about neuroplasticity, critical periods in development, and to lead to new understandings about what is optimal for learning, the hows, whens, whats, and why. And in all, this has powerful translational impact that challenges decades of medical and educational dogma. What we have seen this dogma flies in the face of what we know now about human biology, and this offers solutions. With that, I'll say thank you.